health and fitness with David Hollywood. With DS Sports, the team wear specialists. Lightning fast delivery and unbeatable service at dsports.ie. Hello and welcome to this week's programme. Let's have a look at what's coming up on the show. Very shortly, we're going to be joined by an elite level cyclist that's been flying the flag for Offaly and Ireland on the international stage. She's also a nutritional expert, so stay tuned if you're a club cyclist or runner looking for fueling tips. I was at the launch of a new league this week. The Combined Counties Football League are running an under-17s League Cup and Shield for young women for the first time. You'll meet the players and coaches who've been crying out for this level of football. And Sport Ireland are sending coaching experts to the Midlands. You'll find out where and when on this week's programme. I am joined in studio on the show uh, this evening by a lady I actually met in Mountrath a couple of weeks back uh, during the Ross Naman, uh, Killina and Offaly's uh, Ellen McDermott uh, from, uh, I suppose, two teams that we have to mention. Of course, the team you were guesting for at the Ross Naman, uh, Team UCD Cycling Club and uh, Kukens Raydant are the, the Belgian team, Ellen, that uh, you do race for. Uh, thanks very much for coming in to join us. Thanks very much for having me. It's great to uh, talk to a local uh, radio station about this kind of stuff. Yeah, come here. So let's start off with the, that that exact uh, topic was you were racing through the Midlands uh, in the Ross Naman and uh, just chatting to you after what would have been a, a pretty tough stage uh, coming off the cut um, on stage two of the Ross Naman. You seem to be really enjoying yourself. How was how was the the the, the race overall for you? It must, it must be pointed out, like uh, Team UCD Cycling Club, best Irish team in in the race. Yeah, that was it. We got we picked that up um, at the end of the race. Um, we were obviously fighting with other kind of fully Irish squads that were at the team. Like there was a I don't know how many teams there were, like twenty maybe. Um, but each team has a as a team of five riders. So we were racing against Cycling Ulster, who who had a full um, squad of Irish girls, and uh, we we did lose it one of the days because it it basically is a competition of you, the accumulation of your best three riders, accumulation of time of your best three riders, and we actually lost it on one day, but then we had a massive comeback, um, which was really emotional on the day, which was good crack, but that day on the cut was probably my worst day um, in terms of time that I lost. Because we basically, we rode from Kilkenny Kel- out to the cut um, and up over the top. But at the top of the cut, there was a Queen of the Mountains. So basically anybody in that classification or anybody who was going for those points, for the Queen of the Mountains points, they were going to pick up points at the top. Mm-hmm. And about 500 metres from the top, the pace just went right through the roof. And I got a little bit distanced and never made it back to the front of the race. Okay. Uh, but... All of that considered, um, you really enjoyed it. And I actually want to uh, quote one or two bits uh, you put up on uh, your social media after uh, the race. I know you, you're oh grimacing dear. here. Um, you've got Jenny, the comeback kid, Nina, uh, Abby, back up again, Conway, Clodagh, one night only, Nigalacor, uh, D, the boss, Quinn, uh, Jason, Kenny, simply the mechanic, Noel Glynn, the manager, and of course yourself. Um it was a really nice social post and you've kind of given everyone a, a bit of a review of their own Ross Naman as well. How did you guys work as a team? What was the atmosphere like in the team? Uh, it was probably the most relaxed I've ever been at one of these Rosses. Uh, I've done six or seven um, in various team kind of kits, but this was the first time I've been on a fully fledged Irish squad. Um, and I was really lucky, I think, to to be asked to come on board with these guys because they're quite a close knit family. Like between Jason, Noel, and Dee, um, they they always work together. Uh, and the two riders that I that I met at the, on the day, um, they're young. Like they are quite young. I'm like at least one of them. I'm nine years older than the other one. I'm like fifteen years older than. So I felt like I could kind of teach them a couple of things while just having a bit of crack at the same time. Yeah, it certainly seems like that was the order of the day and, and, and generally based on your targets heading into the, the, the race, probably a successful Ross Naman as well. Yeah, definitely. I I was always aiming for the crit. So I the crit was the last day. Mm. It was the last stage on the last day um, and it's basically laps of Kilkenny Town Centre. Um, the, the, I mean, they shut down basically the whole city and we do laps of the town and we finish up that kind of Cobbledy Street just in front of the castle 
it's like such an iconic stage. I don't think they'll ever get rid of it because, you know, sometimes they bring in new stages each year. But I think that one is so, I mean, it's so well attended, even in the pouring rain. Like la- last year or the year before, it was bucketing down. And some of the pictures of us coming up the finish line, there's about three or four people deep on the barriers half of them kids like hanging over the barriers just absolutely screaming at us you know to go fast cycle faster Um, so that was that's always like my target Um, and I did get a podium there last year Uh, I got third last year but this year I can only manage 10th but I was happy with that to be fair because it wasn't really on my calendar for a few months prior to doing it um, and I haven't really raced too much on the road mm. this year. Um, my kind of targets have been doing gravel races. So I think I should be happy with that, all things considered. We'll move on to how the rest of the season went in a second. Just to dwell on the point of, like, say, uh, finishing up on that crit in, in Kilkenny, uh, where you're doing laps of the town. And even uh, by the second time you'd come round the finish line in Mountrath, there was a, a healthy crowd there as well. Uh, over the last few years, it, it's kind of... Um, it's almost a cliche to, to point it out, but uh, this whole idea of um, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Uh, and the fact that you get to be uh, role models for young women in sport. Uh, how do you relate to that kind of stuff? Do you, have you noticed an uptick in, in people's interest in, in women cycling over the last few years? Absolutely. Last year, now that you say that, I remember warming up for the crit. It was pouring rain. Maybe it was the year before. Anyway, it was raining and we were all warming up on our rollers, which are basically static trainers and uh, just kind of to warm up ahead of the crit. And a few people, we basically warm up in the GAA centre, which is just around the corner from the actual race itself. Sure. But I don't know who they were, but there was a few um, parents with their children milling around and kind of coming up to see what was going on and there was quite a few with young girls like say seven or eight or nine or ten kind of thing and the girls are sort of standing there like watching you and you can see well you hope that they're thinking oh that's really cool maybe I want to try that kind of thing and then when you see the pictures from 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 the race itself with the with all the kids banging on the barriers and stuff. I really hope that a few of them think, hmm, yes, that's what I'd like to do. Well, you would have grown up in the Ireland that I did where, I, like, it, it, it's a reality that women's sport didn't have the profile that it has now. So, look, it must make a difference down the line, you would think. Oh, definitely. But the big thing about it is, is there is a men's Ross during the year, mm. right? Now, I'm not too sure if you guys covered it, right? But it did start in Tullamore. That, we were down at the, 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 the okay. start. Yeah, yeah. So, but I was down at the start as well and I just thought, I was looking around and I was thinking, well, this is nothing like the women's Ross. We've got so much more going on. <laughs> so now that's obviously a product of uh, the management team and, and, you know, and the marketing and everything like that. But I do feel like the women's Ross is just so far ahead of anything um, that the men do in Ireland. Well, <laughs> no I, I, Declan does fierce work in terms of promoting the Ross as well. Yes, he, he does. Declan yeah. Quigley is very good uh, and great to work with from our media perspective he, he kind of is very helpful and is actually a, a, a sh- it shows a great way forward for, for how to help local media to, to tell the stories that people are interested in and that type of thing uh, talk to us about the story of the rest of your season because as you said uh, not necessarily conventional for anyone who knows you as a, a, a um, road bike racer and that type of thing uh, you were on fatter tyres over the, the course of this year uh, on the gravel and that type of thing how did it happen I know like it's a really it's a developing aspect of the sport. It's getting more and more popular at the highest level as well. That's it. So the reason it happened was COVID, really. Um, my I used to live over in England with my partner, mm. Will, uh, who, and we we lived over in the, in the North Yorkshire Moors and it was just one of the ways to kind of mix up our training when when we kind of had nothing else to do. So we he put me on a he actually didn't put me on a gravel bike at all. He put me on my road bike with gravel tires. Okay. But the fattest tires I could get on it were like thirty fours, which when you look at actual gravel wheels are forty fives. So there was a lot more comfort on a forty five mil wheel, right? Yeah. So I was kind of getting rattled around on these gravel trails <laughs> around Yorkshire and. To the point where I was thinking, surely this shouldn't be so uncomfortable. But I did it anyway. And I raced then in 2022 doing the British National 
gravel champs, right? Which I could do, but I couldn't contest, obviously, the British gravel champs. Um, and I got fourth there and I was like, oh, this is, this is actually quite fun. And it's just one of those things that you just get so addicted to because okay. you can go... And, and over here in, in Ireland as well, like since I've kind of been racing, it, you, you, there's so many places you can go. There's so many places that you can kind of experience in a totally different way when you're on gravel versus when you're on road. Like there's so many more routes available to you. Um, you can go. Yeah, it just, it's a bit mental, really. Um, and I and I love it just for that aspect of exploring new places and that. The difference is stimulating. Yeah, 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. And also there's like there's always a risk that you're going to slide out and, you know, end yourself. But so, <laughs> it's always good fun. And I, I just, you don't, and the, the the biggest part probably for a lot of people is that you don't have to contend with cars. Yeah, so okay. So that's, that's just a huge draw. Like you'd be up in the, up in the blooms, kind of meandering around and not see a car for like five hours if you're up there. It sounds pretty gorgeous actually. Yes, um, Absolutely. You're sitting here today, so presumably you didn't end yourself at any stage. No, but I nearly did today. (laughs) Today? (laughs) I did, yeah. I was coming down and uh, it was was a right-hander and I was kind of going into it a bit too fast. So I had to let out one of my feet and just kind of hop around the side a little bit. But that was good fun. You're clipped in on, even on gravel as well. Yeah, we use mountain bike, mountain bike um, pedals. So Okay, uh, so is it the case that the... is it clipped in or, or strapped in? Oh, it's all clipped in. They're always Yeah, clipped. yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, like some of the races that I've done. So I, I qualified for the World Gravel Championships last year in Italy. Um, I was grossly unprepared for it. <laughs> we were talking about the heat earlier on and I capitulated so badly in the heat. Like, it, yeah, the worst I've ever experienced. But in one of the climbs in there, it was like, I think it was like a 20% climb or something absurd. And if you can't pull up your foot, you know, like say, for example, mountain bikers or um, somebody who's riding just regular flat pedals, if you can't pull up your foot, your foot's just going to come away from the pedal. Um, so it really helps with um, powering, power, like uh, just driving the pedals if it's you're clipped in. It's not just pushing down, the other foot can pull up. It has a, to pull up, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah. yeah. it makes sense. Um, what about next year then? Is it going to follow a, a similar path for you? Do you know what your general racing plans are? Or that's all to be determined. Uh, that's probably all to be determined because this season is very much not finished. I have the World Championships next week. Oh, wicked. Uh, okay. It's on the, the 5th, the 5th or the 6th um, over in Belgium where I have been racing this year. Um, and I I only decided yesterday that I was going to do the elite race so I qualified this year. Um, basically, with gravel racing, you do all the you 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 can qualify for the World Gravel Championships if you qualify in the top twenty five percent of your category at one of the World Series. Okay? okay, so and there's like twenty World Series races. I did one in Poland, in Sweden, in Belgium. And I didn't actually qualify for the elites just because the level is gone through the roof. Oh, I did one in Scotland as well. Um, but I mean, the standard is just, it's its incredible. And you're literally racing against World Tour pros. So Demi Vollering, like Cassie Niamadoma, they're all doing these races. And the crossover has exploded, hasn't it? From from the World Tour pros yeah. uh, 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 who suddenly are mad to be uh, doing all this kind of uh, off-road gravel, stuff and, yeah. uh, and that type of thing. And I I think it's just the appeal of it because it's so so much fun. But then you've also got girls who are doing it full-time. They're getting paid, right? So you've got full-time gravel racers in the elite race and then you've got the World Tour pros. And then you've got these people like me who are kind of doing it more for a hobby uh, and are training as much as they possibly can, but I'm never going to get into the top 25% of races when there's only about, like, say, 15 show up. So you have to be in the top, like, uh, three or four wow. of the race. Okay. Do you know? So it's really hard. Um, but Cycling Ireland got in touch with me during the week and they were like, Ellen, we can put in a wild card entry for the elite race. So uh, they, I think they have a certain amount of wild card entries uh, allocated to them and they can submit them and that's how I'll get to do the elite race. Very cool. Okay. Yes, I'm delighted. Well, and, and just just reward for for um, racing at all these uh, events like um, 
how does the calendar agree with you? You know, you go to all these countries, you're uh, there for a, a clutch of days or whatever mm-hmm. and away again. Do you find yourself being able to perform under those circumstances? How do you find it like lifestyle wise and that type of thing? Well, I have to sit down with a wall planner on the floor and I have to like it, it does take a lot of time to plan, mm-hmm. but I love planning and I love calendars and I love blocking off time. Um, so I don't mind doing it. But like it is a case of, say, the last trip I did, um, I went to I went to Belgium first and I did a race there. Then I went from Belgium to Sweden um, and did a, a, a three day race there, which was a lot of racing for the amount of time I was there. So it really made a lot of sense to do that one. Then I came back to Belgium, did another race and then I came home. So I was away for three weeks um, and quite a bit of flying around and um, and trains and, and such like. But I think because I had committed to it and had set aside the time and I tried to make it so that, that my work wasn't too busy because so I'm self-employed. So I tried to make it so my work wasn't too busy that I had the time to recover um, and gave myself enough time to recover between flights because I don't really fly too well. I think it's because I'm so old. Um, and I, yeah, it, it worked quite well and I came back from that like happy with all my results really. Okay. Um, the final question for this part of the uh, discussion, then we're going to talk about what you're self-employed about uh, uh, shortly. Uh, the sport of bike racing is really... Uh, an interesting existence. You've alluded to just say one aspect of it there, which is uh, the planning and the travel uh, mm. uh, for 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 picking out the races you want to do. Uh, but it, it's just so testing and it requires so much commitment. Uh, what attracted you to it? What keeps you competing at it? Um, do you find all of the the kind of difficult aspects of it easier than we'd imagine? Mm, that's a good question like what keeps you motivated because um, I do know people who have retired from the sport and they just lose the motivation and once the motivation has gone it's really hard to get it back okay mm. unless you've got some other stimulus right or if you find something else that you can work on that will make you go faster because cycling is all about who can go the fastest there is only one winner um, and like say with climbing you kind of benefit from being a few kilos lighter than say if you don't have as much power as sort of, sort of the heavier ones. And for me, it's because I'm learning so many new things because I didn't get into it until I was like 26. So I ha- I'm not really doing it as long as, say, somebody who's been cycling since they were under 20 or under 16, say. Um, and I'm finding something new. And with gravel, it was just a whole new lease of ex- exploration and that. And then with this year, I tried a couple of different um, training protocols that helped with my performance as well so you can always kind of see these improvements and then and there's just something really nice about feeling really fit when you're training you know because I go out with the Tullamore Cycle Touring Centre um, TCTC the club right yeah. I, I never remember what it all stands for but I go out with them on a Tuesday and I'm with their sort of A group and like I'm riding around with these like I don't know 40, 50 year old men who are all really strong and I get a little win if I can beat them in this in this town sprint for the town sign kind of thing, and there's something quite satisfying about that. So I guess that kind of keeps me motivated as well. You're able to find the joy in what you're doing. Oh yeah, yeah. Look, you're flying it if that's the case, because that's ultimately, I think, existentially what what we all should try land on. Generally mm-hmm. speaking, um, we're going to take a very short break on health and fitness. When we return, uh, we're going to learn what MacD Nutrition is all about. Ellen McDermott is in studio. We'll be back shortly. Health and Fitness with DS Sports, the team wear specialists. Experience lightning fast delivery and unbeatable service for all your sporting needs at DS Sports. With gear ready in as little as five days. Contact 085 87 15 311 or info at dsports.ie. Midlands 103. Welcome back. I am joined in studio on Health and Fitness this evening by an elite cyclist, Ellen McDermott, uh, Offaly and Kukens Radant, the team she cycles for. Uh, she guested for uh, Team UCD Cycling Club at the Ross Naman. Uh, Ellen, the other side of your career is, uh, I suppose, adjacent to competitive cycling in that uh, you run MACD Nutrition. Uh, tell us what that is first and foremost. So I'm a performance nutritionist. Uh, I the reason I started it was because I was just looking for help with my own nutrition and I was working with uh, a nutritionist myself and then I just I got so interested in it and 
I kind of went down a bit of a rabbit hole studying it for myself. And then I realised, oh, I can probably do some qualifications here. So I got some kind of basic qualifications. And uh, and now I basically work one to one with athletes on their performance specific nutrition. So say, for example, I've got athletes who are just uh, basically wanted to do a sportive. So say, for example, you've got the Pat Colgan um, sportive around the sleeve blooms here. That could be their target event. And they could be like in their 50s and they just want to make sure that they get around the event without kind of hitting the wall, so to speak. Yeah. Um, versus I've got some UCI riders who are basically competing at the highest level. Um, I've got a guy that just raced in the European Championships on the road. Um, and basically I work all online. So I work with uh, people from all around the world. We've got people in Australia, people in, in Dubai, people in America, which is really complicated for time zone scheduling. It's a nightmare. Have um, you had some ridiculously timed meetings and, and this type of thing uh, online? Not so much. Okay. People tend to be really flexible for me. Um, and I've got guys over in Canada who are generally always awake at six o'clock in the morning anyway so that's my afternoon that's great um, and then the guy in Ameri- or the guy in Australia he doesn't mind seeing me in the in his evening which is my morning so th- yeah they're they're happy to work around me um, and when you were educating yourself about this when did the penny drop say do you know what I've got the confidence and the conviction about this stuff that aside from it helping my own career and maybe helping you not have to go to another nutritionist yourself, when did you decide, you know what, I want to be a nutritionist for these other people? I suppose I started kind of working with my sister, right? So I, she was just a kind of a general uh, amateur cyclist and wanted to, was wondering why she couldn't walk up the stairs without being in agony. After I mean, a after big a bike effort crash. or whatever. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And so I worked with her for a little while and she's a vegan. She's um, she's a very fussy eater. So to this day, she was probably my most challenging client, if you like. Right. So I worked with her for a little while and she kind of, I mean, she does amazing things at the moment. She does all these like crazy sportives. Like she did the Donegal 333. She did the, the, the Modelo 24 hour cycle, which is literally riding around Modelo track <laughs> for 24 hours. Right. And she does really well at these things. Like she won them all last year. No way. OK. Um, so you should probably have a chat with her online yeah, or on, on the show. So um, but basically, yeah, I, um, I, I worked with her and then I worked with a couple more of my kind of family members. And then I just was like, like, give me somebody who who I don't know, you know, like and, I, I, and let me see if I can work with them. And I guess getting the qualifications, like you really kind of have to set yourself apart from people who are just sort of nutritionists online because it's not a kind of protected term. Is it the Wild West in that respect? Like A little bit, yeah. yeah. And some some things that you hear about people doing to athletes is like, well, I'm not sure that's really the right thing to do. It's not really studied in the literature. So maybe have another thing. So getting the qualifications has given me the cloud behind it. So now um, after doing my level seven diploma uh, in performance nutrition uh, back in 2022, that's when I sort of said, now I can definitely open up my own business. Okay. So, and that's kind of when I started McDean Nutrition because um, I kind of had the, I had the sort of client base already and then was able to just say, right, now, now it's time. And I, I kind of, yeah, I made some sort of decisions that I had to be confident in my own ability to be able to do it. What's the experience like on your side of the equation uh, when you're working with other people, giving them a framework and provided like they are diligent enough to, to follow it and that type of thing. Uh, presumably, there's great reward out of uh, out of seeing their success, whatever that success looks like, because obviously the, the goal might not necessarily to be uh, the best in a particular race or anything, because we all have our personal goals and that type of thing. So mm. it could be quite small, relatively speaking, on the outside. But from your perspective and obviously the athlete's perspective, it could be a really big thing. I think I I celebrate all the wins, no matter how big or small, right? And I'll, I'll get a message uh, from, say, one of the girls I work with who's based down in County Clare. She sent me a message during the week saying, um, 
and I got th- I got third at the M40, so the the over forties um, race for the national championships, right? The national masters championships in the road, yeah. Which was a huge result for her because she wouldn't be able to make it around the club ride without getting distance off the back, and then say four or five weeks into the programme she was kind of hanging on at the end or she was hanging on but sort of, sort of with grim death sort of at the at the back of the group but then by the time I was finished with her she well she's gone one, I got third at this race but she was like in amongst it and kind of getting involved in, in, the, in the group ride so they're the kind of things that I just get so happy about but then you get I mean there's a guy over in Scotland that I've worked with and he's um, he's winning UCI races and you see those and you're thinking, yes, well done. Because <laughs> I suppose that's the elite level vindication. Absolutely. Because so, like yeah, this vindication yeah. that someone uh, with a low uh, level relatively goes on and, and improves. Uh, but then if what you're doing and what you're working with can bring the best on to be a little bit better, yeah. um, that's got to be exciting. Yeah. And I, I guess for the best, it's like they're already the best, right? And it's just about unlocking a certain pattern of uh, a routine that works for them. I was going to ask, day. how much chat do you need to have to figure out who, the athlete that you're dealing with and their requirements? Uh, that's kind of the bulk of my work is figuring that out. Like once I have all that information, it's really easy for me to plug all that into a plan. Um, but say, for example, if I've got a vegetarian or if I've got someone who can't tolerate dairy or someone who gets really nervous before the race, hmm. um, they can't stomach eating like, say, a bowl of overnight oats before a race. Whereas yeah. I would have no problem doing that. So... But so for them, you have to really think about, well, what what kind of energy can we get into them the day before to kind of pack up their energy stores to to fuel the, the event without them kind of spewing up their breakfast on the morning of, sure. do you know, which is the last thing you want. OK, you bring me on to the next couple of questions I've got there then. Uh, since we have you and your mind in here, we're going to try access maybe some of the benefits of your MACD nutrition since you sat down in front of me. Uh, what about that uh, particular question you alluded to? Performance anxiety might might, might prevent people from uh, loading up with the type of energy they need the morning of. Uh, first, then, w- w- what do they do the evening before or the day before as a, a compensatory measure? OK, well, let's just use you as an example. OK, so you did the Tullamore Marathon there um, a couple of weeks ago. That's right, yeah. How long did you take to do it? Uh, I ran it in an hour 39. An hour 39, right. So that's just on the cusp of um, benefiting from carb loading the day before. OK, so a 90 minute event is kind of where you, oh, you, you kind okay. of uh, draw the line under, right? So... The day before, that's when you want to focus the whole day, not just the night before having a big bowl of pasta, right? Um, For any athletes I work with, I will get them to fuel between 8 to 10 grams per kilo of body weight of simple carbohydrate, okay? So if I'm talking about myself uh, as a 60 kilo athlete, that's about 600 grams of carbohydrate, okay? Of simple carbs, carbs, which means like rice, pasta, white bread, uh, jellies, fruit juices, um, jams, cereal, that kind of thing, like low fibre cereal. So I'll basically eat that, that all day long um, and that will make sure that my muscles are as full of energy as they could possibly be ready for the event the, the next day. So just to pick you up on something there, low fibre, does that mean like say brown bread, brown rice is actually not the best stuff to be loading up on uh, uh, if you're in a weekend where you've got a big race. Yeah, now being particularly specific about the fact that th- you use this for events, if you do this before every kind of club ride that you do at the weekend, you're going to um, end up with a whole host of health consequences related to a low fibre intake. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So pick your events um, and the whole idea there is that you're not loading up your digestive tract with a bunch of stuff that your body can't really digest and then minimizing any digestive issues on the day. So in particular, people for marathon runners, if you're running, um, you don't want to end up kind of having to dive into the ditch with a roll of toilet. No, it's a famous problem. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The runners can uh, definitely appreciate that. Um, uh, Generally speaking, then it's it's. uh, white breads, pastas and that type of thing if mm-hmm. you're looking for energy for a big race on, on, on the big day. That's it, yeah. And, and I mean, it's for some people it's a bit alien um, and 
they, I'd say for anybody, and I have to say this like all the time, practice it in training. So mm. give yourself an opportunity where you can have a sort of a race simulation um, and practice it the day before. And like make sure you spread it out across the day because otherwise you're just going to make yourself feel ill. Um, and so from the morning to the evening and if you need to top it up with kind of putting honey on things, then that's an easy way. Uh, honey and rice is a great combination. Um, and practice that in training and see how you feel the next day. If it was too much and you're still feeling a bit unwell, like if you're feeling like a bit overly full uh, on the day, well, then just back off and go for eight grams per kilo. But 10 is generally just an easy number to remember. OK, hopefully uh, some uh, club runners, club cyclists have picked up just a little tidbit there that might help them on uh, the next big sport tee for uh, maybe a longer race that they're running in. Um, MACD Nutrition, if anyone wants to look you up, that's how they find you. Yeah, it's MACDnutrition.com. Um, I'm Ellen underscore MACD Nutrition on Instagram. I'm rubbish at updating that, but it is kind of a good way of keeping up. Most important, your contact details will be there. Yes, my contact details will be there. Yeah, and I have a little get in touch form. That's uh, that's how people would get uh, in touch with me directly. Well, the very best of luck with MacD Nutrition and the very best of luck with the Worlds uh, coming up as well. We'll be looking out for how you get on and uh, thanks for joining us on Health and Fitness. Brilliant, thanks for having me. Next, I'm going to bring you behind the scenes for the launch of the CCFL's Under-17s Women's League, Cup and Shield. Health and Fitness with DS Sports, the team wear specialists. Experience lightning fast delivery and unbeatable service for all your sporting needs at DS Sports. With gear ready in as little as five days. Contact 085 87 15 311 or info at dsports.ie. You're back. Fantastic. Let's head over to the Bridge House Hotel where earlier this week I went to the launch of the CCFL's Under 17s League. This is a momentous occasion for women's football in the region, as you're about to hear. In our first piece, I'm joined by Con Burke from Port Leash AFC, Michael Hibbets from Mount Melick, and first here is Eddie Purcell from FCA Swans in Westmeath. It's electric out there, girls buzzing out there, looking forward to the season ahead. Uh, it's going to be a new venture for ourselves as well into the CCFL. Um, last season we played North Tipperary, so it's a little bit closer to home for us this yeah. season. So looking forward to it. Okay, and, and look, that immediately speaks to the value of having something like this, that um, it, it makes uh, it so much more practical and sustainable for, for clubs and particularly for girls to stay involved. Absolutely, yes, for sure. Um, like our crew, we have a young crew there from, uh, we've back 09s, 08s, 07s girls there, so they're all staying together and looking forward to the season ahead and please God, it'll be a good one for them. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, John, you were just telling me that you, you've kind of landed into this uh, gig recently, uh, so you've got it all ahead of you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it in some respects, like because it's a new thing, it's after starting for the girls, and it's new for the CCFL as well, according to what I'm told. Like, I wouldn't be up to date on everything with the CCFL, and obviously I'm going to have to bring myself up there, but yeah, it's a brilliant, brilliant night here in the Bridge House. From your perspective, then, uh, what are your kind of first objectives in terms of uh, getting a handle on your team and the league and, and how to lead them? Well, obviously, we have to try um, get a few more girls involved because our team is sort of, we've, we're slight at the moment. But yeah, we'll get them there and I think we're, they're coming along brilliant for us. And I'm hoping that we have a good season. That's all I can ask, that the girls enjoy themselves, have a good time there. Well, that's... Crucial and so important, Con, isn't it, that um, we all know and love competition, uh, but the real point of participation sports when you're young is, is enjoyment. Definitely, and like especially with the girls at this age group, uh, we kind of discussed it a while ago there, but it's very important to keep them playing at this age. Because like the last couple of seasons, you'll, you'll find there, if girls don't have football to play, well, then they'll drop off, and next thing your senior teams are decimated. So this is a, this is a great step for... Uh, women's football in the counties that actually girls are going to see a pathway now to a senior team and it'll be, it'll be confident enough say next season or the season after to go and play senior football and most of all it's keeping Jane playing because if he can keep him playing now to play for the rest of their days but if he stop playing they may never come back to the game I think it's high time we heard from some of the stars of the future Lorna McGinn of Bally James Duff AFC and Kayla Berry from Tullamore Town FC just before them, coach at Bale Namulla, John Quilty. It's great to see. It's great to see that there's now football post MSL under 16s. That girls now can go play in 17s and hopefully in a few years 19s and then on into senior women's. It's great to see that pathway 
put in place now this year? Yeah, from what I've been hearing, it's a really important step so that um, we can stop the drop, as they say. Uh, Lorna, how long have you been playing football? I started when I was 12. Okay, you started since you were 12, so you've been playing for how long? Five years. That involves training every week, matches at the weekend, that type of thing? Yeah, every week, yeah, on and off. So that must mean, like, you have to go out when the weather's bad, you have to train in the cold, you have to play matches. You must, like, really enjoy playing them. Yeah, no, I wouldn't change it for anything. I love going out in the winter evenings and the <laughs> winter mornings, even no matter how cold it is. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, and what about you? Do you like training in the winter? Um, sometimes. Sometimes. What position do you play? Centre mid. Centre mid. So you like spraying the ball around distribution, that type of thing? Yeah, 100%. Okay, and how long have you been playing? Um, since I was seven. Since you were seven, okay. So a good long while. How did you get into it? Like, what, where was it? One of your parents dropped you down. Did you say you wanted to play? I actually can't even really remember. I think I just got dropped up and then fell in love with it after that. It's your favourite sport? Yeah, hundred percent. Okay. Now this is a trickier question. Uh, who would be your favourite player? Um, I have a few. Come on, give us them. Um, Caitlin Ford, Katie McCabe, um, Alana McAvoy. Um, yeah, I have a few, but Jess Hennessy. <laughs> yeah, Jess Hennessy just moved to Nottingham Forest as well. Lorna, what about yourself? Favourite players? Uh, probably Kate McCabe or Liam McKiernan. To finish our piece up here, let's chat to those behind the new league. Here's uh, William Healy, Vice Chair of the CCFL. And firstly, uh, Paula Lawler, Child Protection Manager and Division Manager with the Women's Under 17s. Uh, Paula tells us here just how significant the arrival of the league is. It's the first time for CCFL to have the under-17 girls uh, to be in our league and it's going to be bigger and better for next year. This year we have six teams, which is a great achievement, but next year we hope to double that. You're going to double it, that's the hope? Absolutely. Okay, great stuff. William, you've been over the senior ladies' uh, division. Yeah, yeah. Um, In your conversations with the clubs and in your observations uh, uh, with the games that do go on, uh, what do they tell you about uh, girls who go from the junior up into the senior? And and, and it seems like there's there's quite a few ultimately get lost along the way. uh, uh, So this could be important for them. Yeah, see, some clubs had an underage structure and some didn't, so it's great that this gap has been breached now and hopefully people make use of it. Can whereabout carries on through that our clubs that haven't any underage set up or anything like that will try and get involved in this and get some people to come through the, the line up and process and fulfil the senior division fixtures down the line. And so I'm going to go to make the club bigger and stronger and, and make the game more popular as well. And they hope they all enjoy it. That's what we want to do. Like, that's the end of the day, that's all we want to see happen. People enjoying the game. It's all about going down there and enjoying yourself. It's not about winning, it's about competing. Yeah, big thanks again to the CCFL for having us. Chris Hand uh, particularly accommodating and helpful. Next, coaching needs to be inclusive and it needs to develop our young people with more than just sports skills. So how do we coach our coaches? Offaly Sports Partnership will be with us next to tell you. Health and fitness. With DS Sports, the team wear specialists. Experience lightning fast delivery and unbeatable service for all your sporting needs at DS Sports. With gear ready in as little as five days. Contact 085 87 15 311 or info at dsports.ie. Midlands 103. At the end of the month, uh, there's a conference taking place in the Midlands. It's the I Coach Kids Midlands Conference for 2024. It's at the Bridge House Hotel in Tullamore and it's being uh, put together uh, in conjunction with both Offaly Sports Partnership and Leash Sports Partnership. Joining us on Health and Fitness this evening is the Community Sports Development Officer with Offaly Sports Partnership, Denise Coggle. Uh, Denise is going to talk us through uh, what's going on at this uh, sort of coaching conference, uh, basically how we coach coaches to coach children in the best possible way. Uh, Denise, you're very welcome to the programme. Hiya, David. Thank you very much. Um, Come here. The last time I saw you, we were dancing in uh, the park in Tullamore. (laughs) (laughs) We were. (laughs) Now, this was uh, this is for the Her Outdoors uh, campaign that Offaly Sports Partnership and yourself were uh, very busy running off at that time. Uh, So I know there was the Zumba dancing that myself and my daughter took part in with you in Tullamore. But um, there was loads of other stuff going on. How did it go overall? Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah, that was way back in August. Um, Seems like a while ago now. (laughs) But yeah. yeah, so you joined us in the town park with Dorinda. Um, we were doing the the Zumba. That was that was good crack. That and was great. There was four days of kayak, and so there was two sessions a day in four different venues. So I think there was about eighty girls took part in that over the four days. Um, Banner, Pulla, 
Shannon Harbour and Belmount. So we went down along the canal into the kind of the areas that nothing much happens um, okay. kind of more west offaly. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to stay along the canal and show that you can actually use the canal for getting outdoors to you know that it's safe, it's narrow. You can't go too far if they fall off the canal, if they fall off the boat, the side is very close to them, you know, so it's very safe. And it, yeah, like that's uh, a great privilege to be able to kind of uh, bring these things to people. Um, what did you observe over the course of uh, the campaign and, and how the girls interacted with these programmes, how much they enjoyed them? Oh, they absolutely loved them because kayaking is, the, is we just made it more accessible to people to come and try it. That. I suppose it can cost quite a bit of money if you were to go out and do it yourself. Sure. Um, you need somebody who's interested in doing it with you that people can get, I suppose, overcome just with fear with the water okay. and if they fall in. But when you're with a, a coach and instructor like Jonathan O'Mara there from um, Midwest uh, Ventures, he done a fantastic job. You know, anybody who was anyway nervous at all and if there was children struggling, then we were able to tie them onto the back of the boats and, and bring them towed them along so no better place than to be out on the water sometimes oh yeah definitely. on a day like today as we're talking yeah no it was fantastic so yeah. there was there was only one day now um, where the wind changed a little bit and it got a little bit cold but apart from that now it was grand we were lucky we were lucky with the weather from that sense so now Offaly Sports Partnership uh, with Leash Sports Partnership are behind the iCoach Kids Midlands Conference taking place at the Bridge House Hotel at the end of the month that's Saturday the 28th of September I'll just go through all the details it's on from 9.30 to 12.30 uh, plenty time and space there and then uh, for coaches to, to get really good information to kind of network with other like-minded people and, and learn a lot tell us what's going on so yeah um it's it's run on the 26th or the 28th of September. It is a Sport Ireland initiative. So it, like I said, it's run in conjunction between Offaly Sports Partnership and Leash Sports Partnership. Um, there's three guest speakers on, on the day. Um, so Phil Kearney, Sheila Quinn and Declan O'Leary. So they they have huge experience um, in their different fields in research, skill acquisition, development. Um, Declan O'Leary is the president president pre, uh, president coach development manager for Sport Ireland. Um, so he works in that field. And Sheila Quinn then is the kind of the founding member of iCoach, and she's worked uh, with Sport Ireland for like twenty five years. So there's huge experience in the whole coaching centred approach and um, the different aspects to create your inclusive environment you know to address dropout within children and teenagers it's it's open to all coaches of children and teenagers uh, in all sports so it's not just sport specific OK um, so talk to us about the, the, the this this drive towards inclusivity and, and, and stopping the dropout uh, what are the kinds of messages, messages that Sport Ireland are trying to get across um, uh, with these kind of conferences and the I Coach Kids movement uh, to, to, to help address these things? So I suppose the, the, the focus on the coaches themselves is, you know, to give them tools to create a child and teen, teen centred approach within their coaching. Um, so looking at the skills they need to develop, like their own ability to to put the needs of the children and the teenagers first. And like we can take for granted that that's what people who coach children want to do. But um, through no deliberate fault, a, a lot of people can make it about something else that doesn't serve the needs of the young people who are involved there. And uh, maybe it's because of obsession around competition. Uh, maybe it's uh, because of a certain conviction or, or, or an upbringing that they experienced. Uh, but this kind of thing helps to crystallize what we're all working together for. And that's to create a, an environment to, to keep young people and young women as well in, in sport for as long as they're, they, they get the enjoyment out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. So like it's it's kind of given the two the coaches the tools to create and I suppose look outside their own coaching into different environments that then cement within their coaching that they can bring into their coaching. Um, again, like you said, looking at it from a, a child or a teenage perspective. Mm. There's another campaign that Sport Ireland run and it's for her moves, which is specifically research done in relation to teenagers and around the whole idea of teenage girls and dropout. Um, and that's been around for years and, you know, they've never they've never come close to finding out why 
But this is research along that lines, you know, and, and one of the main things that has come out of that campaign is the whole idea of comp- competitiveness can be a factor, you know, that um, particularly teenage years, they're very conscious of themselves, of their ability, of their, they, they just don't have confidence in their own ability, even if they're playing sport. Um, and I suppose it's addressing that or, or thinking about that within your own coaching as well. And, you know, you still have to do your job. You still have to coach girls and teenagers and children that still want to win. But it's, I suppose, providing tools to help you to do that, but still keeping all that research in mind as to why kids drop out, why girls drop out and to provide the coaches with those tools to address those issues if it's starting to happen within their sport. It's a tricky balancing act because on one level we play games to win and and, and competing when it's healthy uh, is exactly that. It's it's healthy and it helps bring us on and and develop our skills and, and sort of get us closer to our potential. But by the same token, it can bring a whole world of other problems that undermine the purpose of sport, which is uh, participating in something together uh, and being part of a team and uh, all of this stuff that we really need, especially when we're developing. Yeah, absolutely. And creating a kind of a fun environment, again, not losing track of the, you know, that you are playing a sport to win it if you're in a league, if you're in, you know, in that sort of competition. But if I suppose if there is kids that are on the fence, it's trying to make sure that you give the coaches the tools to be able to hold on to them or to encourage them back into the sport. Or it, it might be creating a non-competitive game within within your training session or, you know, it's just addressing different different angles, I suppose, and different approaches to how the coaching how you see yourself as a coach. And, and and these kinds of ideas are what's going to be discussed at the at the I Coach Kids conference. These uh, so say any uh, coaches involved with young people at the moment, if they were to come down to the Bridge House Hotel on the twenty eighth of September, they'd be given a practical idea of how to bring this type of thinking onto the training pitch. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. That's um and again the the three guest speakers there have huge experience around the development of sport and the development of coaches um, from different angles, you know, like you said, from the inclusivity to the games management that Declan O'Leary brings, you know, um, Sheila Quinn then is over the eye coach. So that's a global movement. So there's there's huge skill and knowledge being brought by those coaches into this area of, of coach and development. How have you observed how young people are coached. Um, do you think it's kind of a developing area that we're getting a lot better at it? It seems like our knowledge and awareness is increasing uh, on a practical basis. Do you think we're moving in the right direction? Absolutely, because I think sport is now opening up to a wider variety of sports. So we're not just looking at your your typical ga- you know, GA sport, your soccer, your basketball. There's a lot more areas mo- opening up that are competitive, non-competitive, but they're more accessible to people who are not necessarily interested in the bigger sports. So I think, again, that's just addressing different issues. It's creating an environment that is fun, that hopefully will avoid dropout, that, you know, that children then want to come and train. They want to sustain a, a physical, physically active lifestyle. Um and by offering a variety of choice of sports, I think you hope at some point something sticks and they'll stick with it. And then that's what they carry through into their adult lives. Yeah. Look, and if we're looking at uh, issues with people uh, struggling with the sedentary lifestyle and obesity as adults, uh, the, the building blocks like this are so, so important. So look, at uh, the very best to look with the event is the I Coach Kids Midlands Conference at the Bridge House Hotel in Tullamore uh, from 9.30 to 12.30 on Saturday the 28th of September. Uh, In studio with me this evening has been the Community Sports Development Officer for Leaf Sports Partnership, Denise Coggle. Denise, thanks very much. Thank you very much, David. We're done for another week. If there's a health and fitness story you want covered, email me, sport at midlands103.com. Thanks for your company. Joe Cooney and Country Roads is 